Yes, I'm going to tell you a story that will resemble uh, the story that, that Frode told you. Um, but we think alike in many, in many ways, I think, um, about towns at least. Uh, it's a story that uh, is also published now in the Rural Riches and Royal Rex volume for Frans Thees, his 65th birthday, a very important uh, book uh, referring to his ERC project on the Rural Riches. And I was going to talk about Ghent, which is the largest town in, uh, in Europe, north of the Alps, um, in the late medieval period. And we don't have economic decline, at least not in Ghent, at the 11th, 12th century. This, and I will, I will start my story with a story uh, uh, from the early 11th, maybe late 10th century. It's a story that is written down in the Miracola Sancti Bavoris and in <coughs> Ghent, uh, the St. Bavo Abbey, which you see depicted over here, and here you see a relic of that abbey today, plays a very important role. It's situated actually over here. And the story goes about a merchant, Quidam de Cassaciorum, who had failed because, yes, his ship had burned and all the, the ship had gone and the commodities had gone and he had nothing left, so he was now an impoverished beggar. And he came uh, to the Abbey because the Abbey was where the saint was. Uh, and he prayed to the saint, can you please help me? And then he uh, noticed a golden chalice on the altar and he said, ha, ah, Maybe, dear saint, if I can use your golden chalice, um, just borrow it can, for, for restarting my business. Uh, will you allow it? And of course, the saint uh, answered with a benevolent silence. So he took the chalice and went back uh, to restart his business. And a few years later, he was successful again and came back to the abbey. Uh, in order to um, repay the saint and the abbey uh, in, in uh, subsist uh, rich ways and we get the chalice and so on and so on. Now this story tells about a merchant. Uh, yeah, first of all you could say, well yes, it tells you about an abbey and an abbey is of course so rich that it represents the value and, um, of, of many merchants' businesses. On the other hand, it shows you also, like uh, Van Werveke, the pupil of Piren, uh, showed or told already, the merchant is an independent entrepreneur and uh, he's responsible for his own business. Uh, it shows also that the merchant can make considerable profit because in a few years he has his infra infrastructure again and he can pay himself a golden chalice in order to repay it to the abbey. Um, so high gain, high risk uh, for merchants, uh, and that uh, that interpretation, which is more or less correct, I think, of course, uh, fits the Pirene theory. Um, Pirene, who was actually a liberal, uh, a liberal bourgeois, uh, that's the main thing you have to remember about Pirene. Liberal entrepreneurship is progress. He actually wanted to. Uh, explain why the Flemish cities were so rich and important in the later medieval uh, society. Um, we're n you all know that he also made a juxtaposition between the success of the entrepreneur and then the early Middle Ages where he said, well, back then it was all very backward. Now, the other thing that you could um, do with the chalice is uh, move more uh, into the direction of what Franz Thies, uh also Richard Hodges and others write about the tournaments of value in the sense that the chalice is an expensive ceremonial object it is in fact inalienable although it is uh, uh, transformed into entrepreneurial capital and then retransformed again into a ceremonial artifact. Um, this reminds me of what Franz Thees wrote for Maastricht. Maastricht in Archaeological Dialogues about this, uh, the key of Sint one of the great Carolingian art objects. 
um, which is also an inalienable object, a ceremonial object, and that he connected to the role of um, the assembly in uh, Maastricht, Maastricht, where we were last year, um, assembly, but then in the um, association of a basilica, a saintly basilica uh, of St. Servatius, uh, one of the biggest basilica we have in the Low Countries, where in the shadow of that particular saint, the same things happened as uh, Frode actually described, for an assembly place, the legal, the social, the political, and the economic uh, transactions. The, which also brings me to the argument, or Franz Tees, and I follow him there, that long-term trans long transactions are not in contradiction with short-term transactions at all, and that um, on these assembly places and uh, tournaments of value places, Abbey, uh, Basilica, um, that you do have the interaction between both atmospheres and circuits, ritual and commercial. Um, I'm going to go briefly a bit. There was someone who said similar things already 100 years ago and also pointed towards the importance of the thing and hundred there. He's kind of forgotten in literature by now, but we have to think about his writings again. Um, Alphonse Dobbs. And, of course, there is also, uh, like I said, Franz Steens, Chris Lovelock, Julio Ascalona, um, who, are, who have written similar things. This brings me to the question, okay, what is the role of social reproduction and governance by the early medieval uh, peasant society? Because in Maastricht, in that is contradictory to Piren in Maastricht, we are dealing with an assembly place, a rich assembly place from the 6th, 7th century. Uh, not a later, uh, it becomes rich again in the uh, 10th, 9th, 10th century. It has a gap in the 8th century that nobody can explain, but it was a rich place in the 6th, 7th century. So you have to connect it to free allodial landowners, there's no manor at that time, manorial system at that time. And how are these people and how are these governance uh, um, processes, this, this uh, assembly process, how is this related to market development, like Frode uh, asked as well. And we want to go beyond the Piran modernization uh, BS as, as well, uh, like I actually said. We want to connect the periods um, and forget about poor mid Middle Ages. And like I said, it's Ghent where I want to um, discuss this process, actually the market <coughs> of Ghent. Frode actually already ex described uh, ritual assembly. So I don't have to go into that. This is a very nice picture of assembly from 100 years ago, no? Uh, and of course, you know, we park, I don't have to go into that. We also have our own temples in the low countries, by the way, just excavated a few years ago. So we have the central places as well with temples, with uh, important gifts um, made on the surface next to large halls. It's Fasse de Steenbrei. Here is... Uh, Maastricht, but I already told about Maastricht. Maastricht, who, which town uh, or which central place, assembly place, has, uh, of course, also rich craft productions, like the presence of the monetari, glass bead production, uh, pottery production, copper alloy production, and so on. And then we come to Ghent again. Um, the town in the 16th century, here is the uh, abbey by um, the second half of the 16th century, Charles V, the emperor, who was actually born in Ghent. They had to destroy the abbey into, uh, and make a fortification around it, but that's the situation. There was a twin abbey, by the way. Both abbeys were, f um, were from the 7th century. Then we have a castle site over here. Uh, you will hear, hear from that castle site more. And then there was a V-shaped fortification over here at number three, around the present cathedral of Ghent. 
And the river, by the way, is the Schelbe. I should tell you the river Schelbe runs through the city. Um, in the early medieval period, we do have a lot of early medieval rich material around the center. This is uh, a very funny place in the sense uh, it's called Fort Arthur. It refers to King Arthur, who was actually never in Kent. Um, but that's typically for the cultural historical explanation. So we find early medieval material. Oh, King Archer was here. Um, but it shows you the wealth of the peasantry. The peasantry, uh, which had their own smaller allodial land holdings around Ghent. Those were studied by Adrian Verhulst, and those were, in fact, not manners at all. Uh, it's their burial ground, and it's also cre entirely a cremation burial ground, which is very funny because it continues until uh, 700. Uh, the funny aspect is that uh, by then we already had for 70 years two major abbeys, so they did not, uh, were not so successful in their Christianization of the society for the first uh, 70 years at least. It shows you the typical wealth of the rural riches, like Franz Steve says. These people gather at the assembly, and we know the assembly not from archaeology, but from a written source. It's Sint Amandus himself who uh, describes it in his hagiography, and he comes to a place where a certain Comes, the Comes is um, uh, at that moment not really a lord, but someone <coughs> who takes an official position, in the Merovingian uh, governance structure, and he speaks about law. They are going to um, execute a slave who had run away. Of course, the saint wants to revive the, the slave, etc., etc. Uh, the people don't like what the saint does. They throw him in the river. He doesn't drown. He come back. Uh, you know all these stories. <laughs> um, but it's interesting that um, the assembly takes place at uh, a certain. Uh, in a certain spot, we don't know where exactly, where they uh, have Fana Bel Idola, so where they have pre-Christian religion. So this reminds me very much about what is known in the north about assembly and central places. And we know that we have these pre-Christian temples because of the Steenbre. So Ghent is, according to me, an important assembly central place for the hundred because Comes account is. Uh, is, is uh, someone who directs actually several centena or hundreds in this time. In the end, the um, saint is successful. That Amandus, I have to say. Uh, Amandus, with support by the king, King Dagobert, uh, actually founds these two abbeys. Blandinium is the one here on the hill, and then the major one. The same bath I mean, where our merchants went. Um, and what we see is, well, that those abbeys start to take over the role of the old assembly. Um, there are market halls. Um, there is something like a ritual annual market in honor of St. Bavo. We don't know how old it is, but it reminds me very much of what the older Merovingian assembly uh, seems to have been. And it refers to what Martin Carver says, that abbeys take over the ritual and assembly aspect. It refers in his study, of course, to Port Mahomet. Uh, but also what uh, Richard Hodges says about San Vincenzo in Italy. It's the ideological aspect that directs uh, uh, the trade, or, not, or at least where the trade takes place. Um, a very remarkable thing is that uh, in the 8th and 9th century, it's actually only in the abbeys that we find uh, archaeology. This is one of the two abbeys, and um, it becomes uh, a stone abbey in the middle of the 9th century, probably following the example of uh, San Vincenzo in northern Italy. You know how Richard Hodges sees San Vincenzo as uh, the main abbey in the in the process uh, where the abbey become monumental buildings and a very remarkable thing this is few of the material of that stone abbey from the 9th century and it includes porcelain from China, Tang porcelain. So it, uh, it is involved in uh, long distance trade uh, at least. 
And to end this brings me back to the late 19th century. Then we have a count, a count, the Count of Flanders, who is related to Charlemagne as well as Alfred of Wessex. And he builds his own uh, power position uh, where the Carolingians have failed. I don't believe in Carolingian success. Uh, I believe in Carolingian failure in this respect. And this is a very rich count. He has huge estates for himself, so he has revenues, and he starts to build palaces. The, county, the important counts are Baldwin in the second, late 9th century, early 10th century, and his son Arnulf called the rich, uh, middle 10th century, and he, they refer to themselves as royalty. They uh, want to be royal. They built a huge palace, for instance, here in Bruges, uh, where they make a copy of, um, of the Dom of Aachen. This is their first uh, power base. Um, and they... Uh, assemble not only probably all the governance over there, but also economy. The aula of the palace is not only the place where the governance uh, is done, but it's also the place yeah, uh, where all the goods from the estates are brought. And it's outside at the gate of the palace, on the suburbium, that the goods from the estates from the count are sold, not in the palace, outside the palace. Um, so we see governance and economy. And then Ghent, we see a similar thing, the old habits from the Merovingian time, and then the V-shape, which is actually entirely comital property. And it's over there that um, our merchant actually goes for his trade, the Abbey is not, yeah, there you have the annual market, but by the 10th century, it's the V-shape that forms the core of the market town in development that would become this largest town in uh, Northern Europe. Um, just going quickly over there. Um, this is, by the way, his second custom. I have to end. Um, but to, to wrap things up, we see how um, economy and power go together and how the old assembly uh, in Ghent and the old cult aspect in Ghent was transformed twice in relation to new power uh, balances. First, the monasteries, which were supported by the Carolingians, and then the Counts of Flanders. And the shipwreck merchant then, uh, who had transformed the inalienable value in alienable wealth and back again, was therefore not acting in a vacuum. He knew what he was doing. He knew how the game was uh, played when he approached the saint. And we have to look uh, also for Flanders, also for the Carolingian North, to the ancient association between cult, assembly, exchange and trade as an important motive for the development of trade and trade towns. And the rest you can read. Thank you. Thank you.